Hello, everyone, and welcome to Episode 5 of Covert and Classified, and I'm your host, Moonlight Graham. On March 23rd, 1912, in Wiersitz, Germany, which is now Wierzysk, Poland, a boy was born into the world by a prosperous, aristocratic German family. While growing up, his mother, who had a love of astronomy, gave him a telescope that would spark this young boy's curiosity about the stars and the planets above. His interest in astronomy and the realm of space stayed with him into adulthood and his passion for that science grew ever more as time went on. The turning point for this aspiring astronomer occurred in 1925 when he acquired a copy of the book The Rocket into Interplanetary Space that was written by rocket pioneer Hermann Oberth who would later on in life become this young man's mentor. By 1930, while enrolled in the Berlin Institute of Technology, the aspiring young astronomer joined the German Society for Space Travel. In his spare time, he worked with and assisted Hermann Oberth in liquid-fueled rocket motor tests. In 1932, he graduated from the Technical Institute with a bachelor's in science degree in mechanical engineering and entered the University of Berlin. It was then in 1932 when Adolf Hitler became the chancellor and leader of Germany that his passion for sending a rocket to the moon would soon be derailed by the coming storm that would sweep this young man and his mentor Hermann Oberth in a direction they did not see coming. If you haven't guessed by now, this young man's name was Werner von Braun, and his impact on the world of rocket technology and future space travel would change the world forever. To get a better grasp on the future events that would later shape and alter the rocket scientists' lives and work, let's go back to the year 1932. Werner von Braun, during this time in late 1932, was made an offer by the German army to finance von Braun's doctoral dissertation if he worked in secret on liquid propellant rocketry. Von Braun was a right-wing nationalist by upbringing, but seems to have taken little interest in Nazi ideology or anti-Semitism. However, as money began flowing into rearmament and eventually into the rocket program, he became more enthusiastic about the regime. In 1937, he was now the technical director at the young age of 25 of the new rocket center at Penamunde on the Baltic coast. At first, he helped the German Air Force develop liquid-fueled rocket engines for aircraft and jet-assisted takeoffs. It was also at this time he received a letter asking him to join the Nazi party. Since it required little commitment and it might damage his career to say no, he went along. The Nazi regime didn't have the same interest that von Braun had for flying a rocket to the moon, but were very interested in using it as a weapon against their enemies. Von Braun and his team were then directed by the Nazis to make the V-1 and V-2 ballistic missiles, which would end up being the first and early versions of the U.S. and Soviet intercontinental ballistic missiles we have today. Werner Von Braun and his rocket team that created the 46-foot-high V-2 rockets, weighing in at 27,000 pounds each, used liquid propellant to launch them into the air and they flew at speeds in excess of 3,500 miles per hour. They delivered a 2,200 pound warhead to a target over 200 to 500 miles away. The V-2 was employed primarily as a terror weapon against civilian targets in England and the newly liberated countries of Western Europe. On September 7, 1944, the first V-2s landed in London and in Paris. By March 27th of 1944, when the last rocket was fired, over 3,000 V-2s had hit Allied targets in five countries and hundreds more blew up while en route to their targets. In London alone, at least 2,750 people were killed by the V-2s. They were mostly civilians. It is estimated another 7,000 people were killed in attacks on the whole continent. Thousands more of the Nazis' concentration camp slave laborers are thought to have perished in the production of the V-2 rockets than were actually killed by the weapons, a fact that would cause many people later on after the war ended to accuse von Braun of being complicit and guilty of war crimes. 
Despite being in the Nazi party and an SS officer, von Braun was arrested and imprisoned by the Gestapo in 1944 for allegedly making drunken remarks at a party about Germany's likely defeat and his preference for building a spaceship instead of making V-2 rockets. Being arrested made him look like a victim of the Nazis rather than a perpetrator. It was Dornberger and Albert Speer who had Hitler's ear and convinced Hitler that Werner von Braun should be released from prison because he was still an asset to the German war effort. After spending two weeks in prison, von Braun was released to continue his work on the V-2 rocket program in Pennamunde. When he arrived back at Pennamunde, von Braun immediately assembled his planning staff. At this time, he knew that Germany was going to lose the war, and he asked them to decide how and to whom they should surrender to. Most of the scientists were frightened of the Russians. They felt the French would treat them like enslaved people, and the British did not have enough money to fund a rocket program. That left the Americans. Von Braun then stole a train with forged papers and ultimately led 500 of his scientific staff through war-torn Germany to surrender to the Americans. The SS was issued orders to kill the German engineers and scientists who hid their notes in a mine shaft and invaded their own army while searching for the Americans. Finally, von Braun's team found an American army private and surrendered to him. Werner von Braun was lucky to be rescued from that situation by surrendering to the U.S. Army in the Alps on May 2nd of 1945, along with others of his team, including his brother Magnus von Braun. The Americans immediately went to Pennamunde and Nordhausen and captured all the remaining V-2s and V-2 parts. The Americans soon after destroyed both places with explosives. The Americans then brought over 300 train cars loaded with spare V-2 parts to the United States. Thanks to American military interest in V-2 technology, Von Braun arrived in the U.S. in September and was quickly sent to Fort Bliss outside El Paso, Texas to prepare for the arrival of his team. Their journey was part of a larger program to import German engineers, scientists, and technicians that is best known as Project Paperclip or Operation Paperclip. Operation Paperclip was a secret United States intelligence program in which more than 1,600 German scientists, engineers, and technicians were taken from the former Nazi Germany to the United States. The American government then immediately employed them into their rocket program after the end of World War II between 1945 and 1959. Due to a growing Cold War with Russia, the United States government decided that the dubious Nazi records of some of their captured scientists like von Braun should be downplayed and covered up. Several of the paperclip scientists were later investigated because of their links with the Nazi party during the war. Only one paperclip scientist, George Riquet, was formally tried for any crime, and no paperclip scientist was ever found guilty of any crime in the United States or Germany. Riquet was returned to Germany in 1947 to stand at the Dora trial, where he was acquitted. Von Braun, an initial group of about 125 German scientists who were brought to America under Operation Paperclip, were installed at Fort Bliss, Texas. There they worked on rockets for the U.S. Army and assisted in V-2 launches at the White Sands Proving Grounds in New Mexico. In 1950, Von Braun's team moved to the Redstone Arsenal near Huntsville, Alabama, where they designed the Army's Redstone and Jupiter ballistic missiles, as well as the Jupiter C, the Juno II, and the Saturn I launch vehicles. At the end of the war, the United States had entered the field of guided missiles with practically no previous experience. The technical competence of Braun's group was outstanding. Later on, he would say, after all, if we are good, it's because we've had 15 more years of experience in making mistakes and learning from them. Von Braun also became one of the most prominent advocates for space exploration in the United States during the 1950s, who wrote numerous books and several articles for magazines such as Collier's. Von Braun, oddly enough, also worked with and served as a spokesman for three Walt Disney television programs on space travel called 
Man in Space. Not many people can claim to have worked for both Walt Disney and Adolf Hitler on their resumes. After moving to Huntsville, Alabama in 1952, Braun became technical director and later chief of the U.S. Army Ballistic Weapons Program. In 1955, he became a U.S. citizen and characteristically accepted U.S. citizenship wholeheartedly. But there were still many questions by the American press about Werner's past as a Nazi who worked with slave labor at the Penamunde rocket factory in the Baltics during World War II. It is unclear how much von Braun knew about the horrific conditions of the slave laborers and whether he protested the use of the slave labor. There was also some questions as to his membership in the Nazi party and the SS. However, evidence shows that the Nazis likely pressured him to join both. This unpleasant history might have weighed on his conscience when Operation Paperclip transported him to the Deep South to help on rocket engineering projects for the U.S. government. In 1950, the government settled von Braun, the other German technicians, and their families in Huntsville, Alabama. Although there was less racial tension in Huntsville than in other parts of Alabama, it was still a segregated state. Von Braun then helped historically black colleges write grant proposals that would secure funding for a stronger curriculum. He then met with local contractors to make sure that black applicants had equal opportunity for job openings. Due to Werner von Braun's urging, NASA decided there would be a summer jobs program because it might help transition black students into full-time positions for the space program. So why did von Braun take the lead on such a controversial issue like segregation in the Deep South? While some believe that his past actions in Nazi Germany weighed heavily on his conscience, others believe that his conversion to evangelical Christianity immediately following the war was influencing him. During the 1960s, he met with Billy Graham and Martin Luther King Jr., and he became increasingly more religious all the way up until his death in 1977. Whatever his reasons, he had a resounding impact on the NASA space program and the direction of civil rights in Alabama. In the end, whatever we may think about Werner von Braun and his dark checkered past, as well as his brilliance in rocket science, he left an indelible mark on the advancement of American culture and the space program. On December 30th, 2021, the billionaire and SpaceX chief executive Elon Musk quoted a popular line from the film Young Frankenstein on Twitter. He tweeted, Destiny, destiny, no escaping that for me. A fellow Twitter user by the name of Toby Lee tweeted in reply and said, Speaking about destiny, did you know that Von Braun's 1953 book Mars Project referenced a person named Elon? who would bring humans to Mars. Pretty nuts. So how did Werner von Braun come to that conclusion, especially since Elon Musk was not even born yet? Maybe he did have access to a time machine for all we know. And with that cosmic statement, I would like to dedicate this episode to Elon Musk and to Werner von Braun, who were and are visionaries when it comes to the future of humanity and space travel. Thanks for watching this episode of Covert and Classified. I'm your host, Moonlight Graham, and I will see you all again. Take care.